Before Adam was created, the Bible says Jesus was the Lamb of God from the foundation of the world. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has reconciled us to God. Because of the blood, our conscience has been cleansed from dead works. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ sets us free from that. 
For some of us, it could mean lifestyle patterns, sin problems, behavior things that was handed down from generation to generation, and now it's part of us. When we testify with our mouth what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for us, it puts us into a place of experiential victory. Greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong today. Uh, it's been our delight to be able to spend this time with you in the Word of God and to pray with you and believe that the Word of God being spoken into your life uh, Im will impact your life powerfully, uh, knowing that God works by the power of His Word and knowing that the Holy Spirit confirms the Word that's spoken and that's released. And so it's, it's, it's with that confidence that we, are, that we come to you, just bringing God's word, knowing that mighty things will take place as you receive God's word under the power of the Holy Spirit. The last several weeks, we've been talking about the power of the blood of Jesus, and this is our concluding message in this series. And what we want to do is to talk about how to receive, experience, and enforce the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So what we've done over the several uh, weeks that, that have gone by is we've talked about various aspects of the blood of Christ. Uh, looking at it in terms of covenant, we're looking at it in terms of being our sin offering, being, uh, being our atonement. Uh, we've talked about the Lord's table and, and in various aspects of what the blood of Jesus Christ has made available to us and does for us. But now the big question is, you know, if all of those blessings are ours through the shed blood of Christ. Uh, how do we actually walk in it? How do we experience it? Because I know that we are uh, in enemy territory. We have the powers of darkness assailing the believer. We have believers, you know, we are in the middle of an ungodly world where there's all kinds of wickedness and all kinds of trouble and all kinds of difficulties uh, that we have to face. How do we avail the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. What do we have to do? Now, some of you may have uh, heard the term, plead the blood, plead the blood. And, and, you know, we sometimes use that term so loosely, not even knowing what it means, or not even know, knowing, you know, how am I supposed to plead the blood? Uh, on, a, on other occasions, you may hear people uh, just chanting away and rattling away so fast, the blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus as though just saying that phrase uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very frenzied manner is going to somehow stir up the power of the blood. And, and, and of course, that's not true. Uh, that's not the way you, you invoke, so, so to speak, uh, the blood or the power of the blood of Jesus. You know, so let's begin with very basics. What we said is this, that the blood of Jesus brings us into a covenant with God that every covenant with God, the ultimate objective of covenant is relationship. God's ultimate objective in setting up a covenant is because He wants us to be in a relationship with Him as His sons and daughters, as His friends. That's the whole purpose of a covenant. And it is established by blood because that's how serious God is about that covenant. He's saying, my life is on the line, so to speak. I'm giving my life for this. I will give everything I have to establish this relationship with you. So covenant relationship is important. So everything we have and everything we receive through the blood of Christ is based on relationship. It's based on this relationship of grace and how we walk in that relationship. So what I want to do, first of all, is, is in this program, to try to give us a few keys that we find in Scripture, important keys that are necessary. We are to walk in the blessings or in the benefits of the blood of Christ, uh, for us to experience and to enforce the power of that blood in our lives. We're going to talk about a few keys. But before we, we bring them to you, we want to look at some examples in, in the Bible uh, of, of people who walked in the power of the blood covenant that they had with Almighty God, and, and draw some lessons from there, draw some insights from there, uh, to challenge ourselves that this is how we are supposed to walk as people in a blood covenant with God, in the new covenant with God. This is how we're supposed to work. And then we want to give about, talk about the four keys 
uh, that are very important for us. You know, one of the earliest examples of a man who knew how to walk in his covenant with God is that of David. When David went out to meet Goliath, how did he go out to meet Goliath? I mean, he didn't go out there because, you know, he had a great armor on. He didn't have any. Uh, he couldn't even get in, you know, carry um, Saul's armor that Saul offered him. Uh, David didn't go out to meet Goliath because, you know, he was a great warrior or because he was a well-trained soldier. There was only one basis on which David went to meet Goliath. You read about that in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 26. David says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The emphasis there is on this Philistine being uncircumcised. What's the, what's, what's the significance of that? Here's a man, a Philistine, who does not have a covenant with God, is what David is saying. On the contrary, David is saying, I am circumcised. I have a blood covenant with Almighty God. And in that covenant, God had promised Abraham that your descendants will possess the gate of their enemies, meaning your descendants are going to walk in authority, walk in dominion over their enemies. And so David right now, as he is going out to face Goliath, is going out based on his blood covenant with God, that God is, uh, is on my side. I'm in relationship with God. As part of his covenant, he said, I will possess the gate of my enemies. I will have authority over my enemies. And so no matter how big the giant looks, no matter how disadvantaged I may be without an armor, without a sword, without a spear, yet my covenant with God is more than enough to knock out this Philistine. Of course, David had his history with God. He had seen, as a man in covenant with God, he had seen how God helped him protect the sheep by killing the lion and the bear. So he had his history with God, and that's important. But when he went out against Goliath, he went out based solely on that covenant with God. There's something very important for us to learn as blood covenant people, that we must learn to walk, make demands, uh, be bold, step out as blood covenant people, and, and say, I am walking in the power of that covenant. In other words, don't let that covenant be a dormant thing in your life. Don't let your blood covenant with Almighty God just be a theological knowledge. Don't let your blood covenant with Almighty God just be a, 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 a nice thing you study in the Bible, but you step out with faith in your life situation, in whatever you are called to do, you step out based on your covenant with Almighty God. Whether it's out, whether you have to go face a Goliath, whether you have to face a mountain, whether you have to step out into something that's uncertain, you do that based on your covenant with God. You live life based on your covenant with God. That's very important. A second incident in the Bible that I want to bring our attention to is in Luke 13, verses 10 to 17. When Jesus comes into the synagogue uh, during his earthly ministry, and he sees a woman who's been bent over for 18 years. And, and she's in the synagogue. She's been there. So imagine this woman. She's been coming to this place of worship over and over again for 18 years. She's been in a, in a, in a bad physical condition. There aren't priests around her. There are teachers of the law around her. But yet she's continuing in that condition. The Lord Jesus comes. He sees this woman. And at that instant, he says, Ought not this woman, who is a daughter of Abraham, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Satan has bound her, and she has a right to be free. So, think of, uh, so look at this very carefully. Satan has bound her, meaning the devil violates a covenant with God. You know, if you and I are not careful, the devil will do everything he can to violate this blood covenant that we have with Almighty God. So even though God has set this covenant up for us, even though Jesus Christ paid such a great price for us by his death on the cross, if we are not careful, we will forfeit the blessings, we will forfeit the benefits, we will fail to avail the blessings of that covenant, of that blood covenant, the shed blood of Christ. And here in this case, Satan violated that covenant. Satan kept this woman bound. But Jesus comes and says, you know, that's not the position she should be in. She is a daughter of Abraham. She is a woman who has a covenant with God. And the devil has violated that covenant. And Jesus said, woman, you are loosed from that infirmity. And she was set free. 
that's another very important thing. What was the difference between all the other religious people who were around that woman and Jesus Christ? Jesus came in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew the power of the covenant, and by the power of the Spirit, he enforced that covenant in that woman's life. So that's very important for us to understand, that it's not enough to be in a religious circle. That's not going to help you. You need to know your covenant rights, and the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to enforce that covenant in our lives and in the lives of those we minister to. We must know what belongs to us, but we must also have the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing upon us to enforce that covenant. Another very important thing, in fact, there are two stories that bear this, this one truth out. In Matthew 15, 21 to 28, we see uh, Jesus. Uh, we see a, a, a Canaanite woman coming to Jesus. Uh, now, this Canaanite woman was a woman who did not have a covenant with God. She was not Jewish. She, at that time, she had no covenant with God. She was a Gentile. But yet she came to Jesus to receive a healing for her daughter who was troubled or was oppressed by demonic spirits. How does Jesus respond? And let's look at some insights that we get from that incident. Jesus, first of all, responded to this woman saying, I cannot take the children's bread and give it out to the Gentiles. In other words, healing, deliverance is the children's bread, meaning it belongs to people who are in covenant with God. The children of Israel, they were people who are in covenant with God, and as part of that covenant, what belonged to them? Healing, deliverance, that was children's bread. And for you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are part of a new covenant, and healing and deliverance is part of this covenant. It's our bread meaning it's what God gives to us, it's what God makes available to us, it's God's provision for us. So Jesus makes that statement very clear, that healing and deliverance is part of our covenant blessing. It belongs to the children, those who are in covenant with God. But notice what this woman did. She said, I just want a crumb that falls from the master's table. I just want that one little piece. So even though she was not a woman in covenant, by faith she received. Because Jesus tells this woman in Matthew 15 and verse 28, he says, Woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you, even as you will. Even though she was not part of the covenant, there was one very important thing she had. She had faith. And because of that, she was able to receive the blessing of the covenant that actually belonged to the people of covenant. Through faith, she received. The same thing we see in Matthew the 8th chapter about the Roman centurion. The sons of Abraham, the, the people of covenant, they were not receiving what Jesus was offering through his life and ministry at that time. And yet here a Roman centurion, a Gentile, not someone in covenant, he comes to Jesus. And you know, Jesus responds in Matthew 8, and he says, I have not seen so great faith, not even in the entire nation of Israel. He says, look, there are all the people in covenant, but they don't have as much faith as this Gentile has. And so he responds to this Roman centurion in Matthew 8 and verse 13. He says, as you believed, let it be done for you. Once again, an example of a man who did not have covenant with God, but by faith he received the blessing of the covenant. But that gives us a very important lesson and insight that it is by faith that we must receive the blessings of the covenant. So if you and I are to walk in faith, uh, in, the, in the power of the covenant, if you and I were to, are to receive, experience, and enforce the blood of Christ in our lives, what must we do? Four keys, very important. First, we must come into obedience. You know, every covenant is based on two parties committing to that covenant. And so on, from our side, we must walk in obedience to the covenant that God has put in place with us. What is the new covenant? What are the requirements of the new covenant? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I must come into obedience with that. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. I must walk in love towards people around me. If I, if I violate what God has asked for me, asked of me in the new covenant, I'm in a disadvantageous position because I'm not positioned myself to receive the blessings that is available to me through the blood of Christ. So come into obedience. Repent of sin. Turn away from wrongdoing. Uh, confess sin and forsake sin. Come into obedience with God to receive the blessing of the blood of Christ. Number two, we must believe in the power of the blood of Christ. 
We must believe in what God says He has made available to us through the cross, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Believe in the person of Christ. Believe in what Jesus has made available to you. Believe in that, that this is for you. It is part of your covenant right. It's part of your blessing made available to you through the blood of Jesus. Number three, very important, is we must declare what the blood of Jesus Christ makes available to us. Revelation 12 and verse 11, the Bible says that they overcame him, that is the adversary, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They overcame the devil by the word of their testimony. And they testified to what the blood of the Lamb had provided for them. What the blood of, of Christ provides for us is what God does for us. Our testimony is what we must do for ourselves in order to receive, in order to experience, and in order to enforce the power of that blood. God has provided the blood. What about your testimony? What are you declaring? What are you saying? Are you attesting with your words and with your faith and with your words what God has declared about the blood of Christ and what the blood of Christ can do for you? So that's number three. You need to testify. You need to declare. You need to say with your mouth and believing in your heart what the blood of Christ has done for you. And lastly, we must welcome the work of the Holy Spirit. First John chapter 5 and verse 6 and verse 8 says this. This is he talking about Jesus Christ. This is he who comes by water and blood, Jesus Christ. And not only water, but by water and blood. And it is a spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth. So Jesus Christ, he came by water, the baptism, and by blood, the blood he shed on the cross. And the Holy Spirit testifies to him. And then it says in verse 8, there are three that bear witness on the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree. That means there are three that are testifying, speaking of who Jesus is. The spirit, the water, and the blood. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the water, or waters of baptism, he was attested by God. Through his blood that he shed, he revealed who he is. Today, the Holy Spirit also agrees to that testimony. The Spirit of God attests to who Jesus Christ is, that He's our Savior, He's a Redeemer, and everything that He has made available to us through His blood. So it is the Spirit of God that enforces in our lives what the blood of Christ has made available to us. It's the anointing of God by the anointing that we administer, we enforce in the lives of other people what has been made available through the blood of Christ. The presence and the work of the Holy Spirit is so important for us to receive the full benefits of the blood of Christ. Four important keys. Common obedience to God. Believe in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Declare with your mouth. Testify to what the blood of Christ has done for you. Welcome the power of the Holy Spirit to make effective in you what Jesus has made available through his blood. Let's pray together. Father, I just pray right now for every person who's watching or listening. And because the blood of Christ has been shed right now, in Jesus' name, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit come upon them and impact their lives, enforcing in them everything that is made available through the blood of Christ. I declare every shame and condemnation and guilt be removed of their minds. I declare, Lord, your peace in their hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, I break off every yoke and bondage and oppression of the devil in their bodies and their minds. I command sicknesses, diseases, infirmities, afflictions to leave their bodies and their bodies to be healed, their minds to be healed. God, we release your divine provision to meet their needs. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way. The Bible is a book of covenants. And God is relational and He wants to have relationship with us. He's so serious about that relationship with you and me that He 
establishes it as a covenant. Meaning this is a solemn oath. Because God is very serious about relationship. And he keeps this covenant for a thousand generations. Meaning, look, this is a covenant that he's going to keep it. He's going to stand by this through time. 